this talk is called semantic site building and I've made a dictionary to explain what I'm getting at with semantic site building. And we're going to be talking about naming things in Drupal as well as why things are named, what they are named in Drupal. So thinking about the names and then the naming that we do ourselves. And the reason that I'm interested in getting serious about how we name things in site building is that I think in the Drupal community, a lot of times there's this perceived hierarchy that there are the end users, there are the site builders, and then there are the developers. And once you get really good at Drupal, you wouldn't want to be doing just site building, you would want to be a developer. And so I think that a lot of times site building, which is really one of the most important parts of having a good Drupal site, kind of gets pushed down as if it's not something to really study seriously and, and not something that, that you should have a great level of experience and quality and thought with. And I really disagree with that. My name is Jody Hamilton. I'm the CTO of ZivTech, which is a Drupal company in Philadelphia. I am mostly a Drupal architect and developer, but I am also a site builder, a trainer, core contributor. I do some front end stuff, um, pretty much a, just a Drupal generalist. And I've been doing that for about six or seven years. Semantics, it, you hear a lot about um, the semantic web and semantic markup and a semantic URL. Um, so I came up with this idea of semantic site building. So how can, how can I build a site in a way that matches what things are named? Like how can I make sure that my content types are types of content? And how can I name things in a way that matches the build? So what do I name my content types? And I'm going to take you through all different types of sections of Drupal where you build things and kind of give you tips on how to name things and how to think about things. Or just the sort of questions that you might want to ask yourself when you're building sites. Some of the basic concepts to this way of thinking is don't be too creative. It's, we use your creativity within the boundaries of the system. So you're building things with Legos, but don't use a wheel Lego when it, you're not trying to use a, a wheel. Okay, so don't like shove them all together in weird ways that's going to break. Pay attention to plurality. So don't call one content type events and the other one article. Um, avoid redundancy. Don't call your theme client name theme. Don't call your uh, menu header menu. And be consistent. So use the same names in your views and your modules and your content types and sort of have site-wide naming systems. Also, don't be too specific when you're naming things that may expand their use. So a lot of times you'll see that somebody makes a view called homepage news. And then later on they decide that they're also going to use that on other pages. And then you're like, why do I have to go to homepage news to change the news that's not on the homepage? It was because they named it when they were trying to build the thing that they were just building right then instead of thinking ahead. Yeah. Um, you don't think I'm moving my slides fast enough? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's right. Um, so this guy is uh, is Drew Plippy, and he's going to be helping me out. Um, 
if you're interested in Drew Plippy, he's sort of like a little tipster guy. Um, there's a there's a website drewplippy.com um, where you can get your fill of Drew Plippy. Let's see if I can get to him. You can actually subscribe to uh, Drew Plippy. Okay. Yeah. If you subs if you if you get the Drew Plippy module, you can subscribe to Drew Plippy's tips, and then as you go around your website, he will uh, give you tips. I know everyone's gonna rush to do that. I don't even use Drew Plippy. Okay. Um, Okay, so I'm going to start kind of going through the different fundamentals of Drupal. And I'm going to start with content type because we're a content management system. So you want to take your content types very seriously. A few things you want to do when making a content type. Use a singular name and fill in the description. I always tell people to fill in the description when they're adding a content type because if you don't do it when you add the content type, you will never do it. There's never going to be a day where you're going to say, oh, it's just a rainy day. I wonder if what I should do today. Maybe I could fill in all my content type descriptions of all of my different content types. Those descriptions are sort of what shows up if you go to the node ad page. And they should be kind of consistent. It makes it look nice if you have descriptions for all of your different content types. And a content type is, you want to remember that it's called a content type because it's a type of content. Now in Drupal 7, you could also define it as a bundle of the node entity type. But we still use the word content type because it's, it's very informative. And so you should think about when you're considering making a content type. Are you making a type of content or are you just thinking about, um, that you just need a, a form and you just need a place to display things or you just need a page to show up on the site. Because if you're not making a type of content which has a unique set of fields and other settings, you shouldn't be making a content type. It gets very confusing when people have hundreds of content types on their site because they made them for all different um, like like they'll they'll make ones for like um, featured news and then one for um, news of the day and then they'll have one for news test and then news test delete me and uh, it just it, it's not if they if they all have the same fields they sh probably shouldn't be different content types. And there are other ways to store data and to display pages than just adding content types. A node, I think this is an interesting word, although it's kind of like become a little bit outdated in Drupal. I'm not really sure why they picked node. I think that might have been one of those things where they just kind of want a word meaning something, John or widget. But I think the choice of the word node is interesting because a node is actually a point where pathways intersect. So I like to think about the way nodes in Drupal are so great at um, making connections. So there's there are, even out of the box, a node has an author. So that's a connection between the node and the user. And then you can add um, a, uh, a category. So that's a connection between a node and a taxonomy term. And then a lot of times people get more complicated and they add organic groups relationships between content or, or they add um, entity reference fields or node reference fields um, that, that like purposefully connect one node to another node or to another entity. And, um, and I think that's, that's a real strength of Drupal is that the content can connect and you can use those relationships in your displays. So it's really important when you're coming up with your architecture 
to think about how does everything relate to each other. A lot of times you'll get mock-ups and it'll just say related content. And you'll say, well, how is it related? They say, it's just related, right? It's really important to figure out what all those connections are. Um, here. Drew Plippy wants to point out that if you're, if you're writing PHP, is that really a piece of content? Or is that some functionality? You should never use that PHP filter. It's the red flag of core. And if you need to write some custom code, then you should be able to do that in a custom module. And you can make your own menu callback. You don't just, because you need a page does not mean you need to create a node. On nodes, there are fields. And a field is kind of any element of data. And then there are also field groups. That's a separate module from Drupal core that's very useful. In, with field groups, you can group your fields and you can put them into all different types of arrangements. And that makes your forms look a lot nicer when people are adding content. And field groups can also be used like on the display side as well. I think it's important to remember that kind of the whole point of fields well, there are two points of fields. One is that people can fill them in. And the other is that they provide data storage. If you don't need both of those features, you might not need a field. So if you, for example, just want to display something on a node, but it's not something that you want people to edit, and it's not something that actually needs database storage, you don't need a field. And there's actually a, uh, a nice hook that adds like fake fields. Does anybody remember what that's called? It's like hook field, thank you, field, hook field, extra field info, something. And I actually use that a lot and have to look up the name every time. Um, but it kind of lets you add fake fields that you can then control in the display field settings on an entity without having to add uh, a field and then and then have to like form alter it so that people can't edit it. I always think that's silly like to have a field that you then try to remove from the UI so that no one can edit it and I've seen even worse than that like I've seen a site that was actually a pretty big site and it had a field on it that that like said in the description magic number field don't edit me and in that field would be like a node ID that showed like where that user had come from when they had filled out the form and if you removed that it would mess up the the content completely if you changed it to something that wasn't a number I think it would just give a fatal error and it was just like, really? Like, you, in your user interface, you just like told people not to edit something? It's not, not a great practice. So an entity relationship, I kind of touched on that a little bit with nodes. There's so many great ways to relate entities, and you really want to think about why and how you are relating things. I use entity reference module a lot. I use organic groups a lot, taxonomy fields, and even the node authors. View modes have really kind of come into their own in the past couple of years. So a view mode is something that you see on entity, um, like on the display fields tab on an entity. So usually you're thinking about a content type, but it might be another type of entity. And on the and on when you go to that display fields tab, you see these like sub tabs that have the different view modes that you can configure how the fields display. And um, usually these are like default, full, teaser, RSS. These are you can actually extend these and, and make up extra view modes um, if you use a module called Display Suite. Now, Display Suite is 
I really recommend because you can you can come up with good names for your view modes with display suite so you could say okay I have a view mode called search result and I have a view mode called uh, micro display and you can come up with these in your architecture plan and then when you tell which views you're going to make you can say this on on this page we're going to have a view of micro displays or on this page we're going to have a view of search results and that way you can standardize across your site how things are displayed and then instead of making all, a bunch of different views where you have to configure all of the fields you can just not use fields in the views and just use um, like the full entity and pick what, what display mode you're using and what's great about that is that later when the client says we want to change the way this these fields are displayed everywhere on the site you don't have to go back and edit 55 views you can just change the display modes on the entities when you're naming these view modes you should give them reusable names and use the same ones across different content types so you don't want to have an event content type that's called that has a display mode of search result but then you don't but then you don't have that search result display mode on a different content type that also comes up in search just use the same ones across the board and figure out for each content type how they're going to be displayed in those display modes um, sometimes it's kind of hard to come up with creative names for the display modes that make sense and aren't like teaser teaser 2 uh, other teaser little teaser um, I, I like to go with search result micro mini um, and make sure that those are clearly explained in the architecture docs let's talk about taxonomy um, taxonomy you always have to when you teach people about taxonomy you always have to explain okay there's there's a vocabulary and then there's a term now those are very interesting that, that that's what we use as names in the taxonomy system um, it kind of informs what types of things maybe should be taxonomies a vocabulary is a collection of terms or a body of words and then a, a term is a word or phrase used to describe something so I don't like to see vocabularies filled with terms that don't at all match what I think a vocabulary and a term are um, so I, I like for example if your vocabulary is regions and then your terms are Northeast Northwest Southwest that makes sense to me this is this is a language this is a set of words um, that we're using so that makes sense as a vocabulary and a term but sometimes you see things that don't really make sense I don't think you should get too creative with taxonomy I think people used to get very creative with how they use the taxonomy system um, especially like in Drupal 5 because there weren't a lot of other great systems it used to be a long time ago that taxonomy was like one of the main things that we had in Drupal and people would say like you should use Drupal because of our taxonomy system nobody really says that anymore because there's so many other great systems um, but what I mean by you shouldn't get too creative with taxonomy is I get kind of freaked out when I hear about modules that kind of take two Drupal words and shove them together like comment node taxonomy menu menu node block taxonomy you know those mishmash things are like kind of interesting and sometimes you need them but sometimes I think people are getting really creative with well I really like this taxonomy system how else can I use it to do things that have nothing to do with taxonomy and maybe it would make sense to take a step back and think about how you could build it in a way that made more sense and the reason that that I think it's so important to build things so that they make sense and are obvious with their names is so that people can maintain them and people can understand them and they're less brittle if you when you build things that that 
when somebody else takes over the site, they go, why is this a taxonomy? Like, how is this part built? I can't figure it out. It looks like a menu, but, oh, it's not a menu. It's just like a block with some text in it. How do I edit this? I, I don't know, because it looks like a node, but it's not. That makes things really confusing for the entire life of the site. And it's also really difficult to make change these decisions later on. And if you and if you do things in ways that are off the beaten path and are a little bit odd, like the taxonomy many like we just saw in the last session in this room, I really enjoyed. But there was this part about the using the taxonomy menu and all of these you know, be careful when you do this and don't change it in this other place. And and that's what happens. That's what happens when you use things that are like, try to mix and match them in weird ways. Then it's like, okay, well, you know, don't edit the menu in, in the other place um, because it's actually taxonomy. It's very confusing. And it's hard, to, hard for people to pick up and remember. Image styles are notoriously hard to name in Drupal. So image styles are like when, when you go to like media image styles, it used to be called image cache in Drupal 6. It used to be a contrib module. An image style is usually just like scaling an image. So a lot of times people will name an image style as, um, they'll call it thumbnail. That doesn't get you very far because the next one you make that's a little bit of a different size, what are you going to call that? bigger thumbnail um, and then other people will try to name them by the actual size so they'll say okay this image style is 200 by 200 guess what's gonna happen clients gonna come back and say can we make the images a little bit bigger now they're 220 by 220 but the style is still named 200 by 200 that's a confusion that's always going to bother people. People are always going to be like, what is the, um, oh, I thought it was 200 by 200 because that's what it said. And, and there's going to be wasted time. And I think people who, even beyond site building, I think as engineers, we've come to understand that bad naming wastes time. And when you, and when you have a project where things aren't well named, the it keeps on repeating again and again these same conversations of, wait a minute, what is that again? Um, so one time I had like a, a, I was doing a discovery with a client and there were two terms that kept being used throughout his documents and when I would talk to him. And it was, and it seems like sometimes the, it, the term meant one thing and sometimes it meant a completely different thing. And you had to try to f constantly wonder which one it meant. So I said on a call, can we, um, can we just decide which one this term means and come up with another term for the other thing? And he said, absolutely not. This is how it works. When my assistant uses the term and anyone else in my organization, they mean A. But when I use the term, it means B. So every time I use the term, switch it in your head. And I said, okay, we're not doing this project. Um, an another thing, another time I had a, a project where they called, there was something called um, a participation. They wanted, their, they wanted their users to create a participation. And every time we would talk about the project and they would say, we need the participations to work differently, then we would have to have this little conversation where we would say, what are participations again? Oh, they're this content type, this content type, this content type when they're used in this program, but not when they're used in this program. And sometimes they mean it also includes these other things. So every time we would have to go back and say, all right, um, what did you mean by participation? And they would say, a participation. It just means a participation. We could never peg them down on what these words meant. And the amount of conversations that we'd have, first the conversation would start off with, what does it mean? Then it would spiral into like 10 minutes of frustration about how ridiculous it is that they can't decide on what it means. And like the amount of like extra time that this took was ridiculous. So what, to get back to image styles, um, it often, my, 
suggestion for how to name the image styles is to try to name them the same way you name your display modes. So if your display modes are called teaser, full, search result, micro, mini, name your image styles the same way. Because typically, if you, if you work with display modes and display suite, typically you'll be displaying the images within one of those display modes. So that way it'll be consistent and it won't be all confusing like, oh, sometimes in the teaser display mode, we use the thumbnail image style, but in the search result one, we use the mini image style. And then if I've had, I've had projects where I've had to like assign someone a ticket to spend like hours trying to match up the 15 content types and the 15 image styles. If you're using media module that adds like a whole level of other complexity and try to make them all consistent, it makes sense because it wasn't figured out at the beginning. Roles I think are often badly named and overused in Drupal. Um, a role in Drupal is a part played by someone. So what part does someone play on the site? Are they uh, an administrator, an end user, an editor? Um, I've, I've seen roles that have all the time, you see sites and they have like 20 roles. And then you have to analyze them and you say, okay, nobody uses this role. Can we remove this role? No user even has it. Or you say, or you figure out, but a lot of times it's harder than that because it's like, oh, well, there are some users that use this role, but they all have other roles. And the other roles have the same permissions as that role. So that means there's no purpose in that role at all. So then we can remove it. But that takes a while to figure that out. Um, you should never have roles that have zero or one user, unless it's like an incredibly small site and you really only do have one admin and there aren't a lot of roles. Um, you want to rely on the on permissions, not roles, as much as you can. So, for example, when you're making a view and you have to use the access control, don't don't say you can pick in there if you use the views access controller or in panels. You can say who's allowed to access this view, and then it'll say, do you want to do this by role or by permission? Do it by permission because that's the way everything works in Drupal. So don't, and it, you'll see the same thing like in, in blocks. You can limit who sees a block by role. I don't really like to do that because you shouldn't be limiting things by role. You should be limiting them by permission because the roles might change and, um, and you should be consistent with the way the whole rest of the site works. Um, so you shouldn't have roles that are named like Ellie's role. That's actually a, a real example that happened to me. I had a client who they wanted um, they wanted their boss to have a role that she would think had a lot of access, but wouldn't actually let her do anything. So it would give her like a lot of like admin pages and like really harmless ones that she could get to, but like sounded really complicated. Um, so they just called it like Ellie's role, you know. Um, the other problem is if you have a lot of roles and a lot of permissions, what happens when you go to your permissions page? It just gets a white screen. That's kind of like a, a core problem. It just kind of will show so many permissions that it'll just blow up. And there's a, there's a module a lot of people use that like helps filter out the permissions. Does anybody remember what that module's called? It's like a permission filter module. A lot of people use that. Okay, let's talk about menus. Uh, a menu is a hierarchical structure of links for site navigation or a list of options available to a computer user. Oxford Pocket Dictionary of Current English. By the way, I'm, I made up a lot of these um, definitions. Some of them are real though. Um, so, I think sometimes menus are underused. Sometimes people will just create a block and shove some links in there. And when you do that, it doesn't use the Drupal path system. So if you update the path, the links just won't work anymore. 
and you also can't get some other advantages like having active states on your links or having it affect the breadcrumbs. Um, so I think you should try to use menus when you're creating something that's like a menu. Another thing you want to do is have as few menus as possible, and that's really true with every single thing I've, I've brought up here. You, you don't want to have too many of anything. You want to have the minimum number, but just as many as you need. Okay, so you shouldn't have like eight menus, unless you're using like organic groups menu, which is one of those uh, mashups of two Drupal names, but I actually kind of like that module, so. Um, I should point out that I'm being very um, extreme in some of this advice, but you want to take it all with a grain of salt and, and make compromises when you need to, but kind of know when you're compromising and, uh, and whether it's worth it or not. And just, you know, be thoughtful about what you're doing with site building. Um, so I think instead of having lots of menus, I recommend using menu block and relying on a, um, relying on sort of secondary navigation that's part of one menu tree. So I like to see most websites as like one tree of content and um, and other pages. So I like to, if you, instead of having like your little about menu that goes on the side of about pages, use menu block and have the about menu items be underneath the about menu that's in the main menu. And that way you have a single tree, but you still display what you want to and your breadcrumbs um, should then always make sense and kind of go back to the home being the top of the tree. Um, you should also realize that in, in Drupal, the menu system is pretty complicated and, and permissions are built in to which menu items are displayed. So you can add things to menus and rely on access to, um, to only display the menu items that people can see. So you don't necessarily need a separate menu for admins or editors. You could put all of those items into the same menu and other people just won't see them. You can also kind of like add the logout item to a menu and people won't see it unless they're logged in. So, you know, that's a really nice feature. Um, has anybody ever had the issue where they have a piece of content, a node, and it's in one menu twice? And their client insists it belongs in the menu twice. The contact page belongs under contact, under about, but it also belongs under staff. Okay, so now it's in there twice, and then they complain, well, I don't get the breadcrumb I want it to get. Because, and you say, well, how am I supposed to figure out uh, w where the breadcrumb is supposed to be when it's in the same menu twice? There's actually a, um, a core patch that I'm trying to push, I don't have the URL unfortunately, where at least for a node, when you edit a node, you can put it in the menu, and you can only put it in the menu once when you edit a node but you can add it to the menu administration multiple times. So I think that one where you put it in the menu on the node edit screen, that should determine the breadcrumb. And that way, if you wanted to change where the breadcrumb was, you would know where to edit it because that would be like the canonical one. So that's a really simple patch that I use on, on every project. Oh, well, that's my next issue. Okay, so so paths and breadcrumbs. So I really strongly believe that your, your path, your breadcrumb, and your position in the menu should all match. So even though Drupal doesn't have like a series of directories with HTML files in them, that's still kind of how URLs work on the internet. So they always kind of look like there's a bunch of nested directories. So you'll be on a certain page and it'll be like staff full-time Jody Hamilton. So it looks like they're in directories. And I think that if your path is staff full-time Jody Hamilton, your breadcrumb should be home staff full-time, right? So they should match. 
And they should also be in that position in the menu. Whether or not you show the menu to sh in a way that shows all of that hierarchy doesn't matter. But that should be how the hierarchy is built. So in order to kind of get my, uh, my paths to match my breadcrumbs, I end up having to do a lot of work because it's not like, I haven't really figured out the best system. Um, so obviously you want to use path auto. And you, and what you do is you set, for example, for a content type, you'll set that for an article, it sh its path should be news slash title, right? And you kind of have to do that separately for every content type because you want usually the plural of the content type. So for an event, you want the, the path to be events slash event name because you're going to have a landing page that's at events. So you shouldn't call your events landing page calendar unless you're going to label your events as calendar slash event name. Because you want people to be able to navigate the site by playing with the path. It always frustrates me when I'm on a website and um, like for example, I was trying to like look at the vagrant base boxes yesterday and I saw that there was a link to a vagrant base box at downloads.vagrantup.com slash blah blah blah. So I was like, well I want to see all of them. So I'll go to downloads.vagrantup.com and I just get like a fatal error. Like there is no page there, right? I don't like that. I want to be able to like infer where the landing page is from another path that I'm seeing. Um, so, be unfortunately, because some words don't get an S at the end on Engli in English when uh, you have a plural, like news doesn't get an extra S, you, um, you have to kind of like make each content type's path, path um, structure separately. And there's some modules that I've used, I haven't really decided what the, my preferred one is, but there's one called like path breadcrumb. Or, or breadcrumb by menu or something um, where you can kind of like make the breadcrumbs pick up from your paths instead of from the menu items. Sometimes that makes more sense. Okay, let's talk about views and naming views because these go wrong a lot. Um, so I had mentioned before like you'll see a lot of times homepage news ends up being the view that holds everything about news. So you really want to think about buckets because Drupal is so flexible and you keep on changing things unless you've architected it all out. I've, I've come to do that where I'll, I'll give the site builders a plan that says this is the name of each view that I want you to create and these are the displays that each view has. Um, because otherwise, even if they're very good and thoughtful, if you end up sending it to three site builders to build it all really fast, there's going to be a lot of um, mismatch. And so a couple of people are, are making news views and they don't realize that they should be working together and doing it with the same um, display mode. So you end up with like all kinds of like inconsistency when that happens. Um, so, so think of your view as a bucket and think of your your displays in that view as like variations on that and try to give your views displays names. So like by default, as Drew Plippy's saying, when you add a new page view display, it's just called page and the next one's like page one and page two. Take a second to, to rename those. It makes things a lot faster in the future when you're trying to figure out which one you're supposed to be editing. And another thing that you can do in views that makes it a lot more usable is you can actually name your fields and filters and contextual filters. There's a little section that says like um, advanced settings or administration or something that's like a little like field set that you open up when you're um, editing a field or a filter. I think it says like administrative name. You can actually, if you, if you have like kind of complicated things going on in views, you can give them descriptive names. So say you've got like a first name field and a last name field and you've excluded the first name field and you've rewritten the last name field to show first name space last name. Then what you should do is is instead of it saying last name like it will by default, give it an administrative name of full name and that'll be a lot less confusing in the future. 
And especially if you have very like complicated relationships and contextual filters, it's nice to like name them for what you're actually trying to do there. Um, a, a panels page is a great, uh, I really recommend using panels. Uh, there were some ups and downs in panels, but I think we're really in the golden age of panels now. So people don't have too much trouble naming their panels pages. They usually are named like home page, search page. Um, unfortunately, in panels, there's a huge naming problem because the panel panes are called content types. Don't worry about that. Blocks. Don't use them. Um, if you're going to use them, name them something, give them good names. I don't know. I, w I would recommend sticking with panels. Blocks seem kind of antiquated to me. Um, they're just not very flexible compared to panels. Like, it's just like, you can only use a block once for one thing, unless you're using context. Like, you can say, like, I want the block to be in the right sidebar, but it's like, well, what if you want it to be on the left sidebar on some other page, you know? And, um, and what if you want to, like, have more, um, like, relationships between to be able to pass relationships to your block. Like, the like panels is just like a, a much more advanced system than block. Like, if panels didn't exist, then it would be like, yeah, let's just use blocks. But panels is just so much nicer. And then context is a module that people use that don't use panels, or sometimes people use both. Um, I think uh, what I used to use context a lot, and what really ended, ended my relationship with it was uh, was trying to teach a client how to like add a new block. And they were like, what's a context? I was like, well, context is an abstract section of your site determined by conditions. And then it has actions such as possibly displaying a block. And you have to use this weird interface over here. But first, you have to create your block in this other interface. But don't use the other parts of that interface. Ignore those. And then come over here and find the right context, which you can only determine by thinking about the names of them. It's pretty insane. So I, um, I don't really recommend context anymore. Uh, but if you do use context, you should make sure that you name the contexts by their conditions, not their reactions, which you'll understand if you use context. So you should not name your context as right sidebar. You should name your context as news. Because the, the reactions are more likely to change than, than the conditions. And I think that's a really important part of, uh, of naming in Drupal, is thinking about what's the most likely to change and what probably won't change. So name things by the things that are less likely to change and expand. Uh, if you use the, the features module, it's good to name your features nicely. Um, so, And the same thing if you're using custom modules. So what I usually do is I'll name a theme for the name of the project, and then never have a module that's also named the same way. You get into problems if you have a module named the same as the theme. And try to also avoid having a module that's called like My Site General. Once that module exists, it will grow forever. So you'll never be able to stop people from adding things to my site general if my site general exists. Force people to separate things more. It keeps things easier to, to use. Um, so I usually end up naming features and other custom modules as, as containers because further code is going to end up going in them. And a lot of times I end up naming them by content types. So they'll be like my site news, my site events. And maybe you'll have one for like my site user, my site social, or like other main features of, of the site. There was this, uh, there was like this development seed project called Kit. I think it's still up on Drupal.org, and it was like all about how you should name your features and other things, and it was like way more anal and crazy about naming than what I'm saying, but along the same lines. So if you love like crazy stuff about being a, a like naming Nazi, 
You should read the kit compliance. Um, so entity is it can be a confusing name in Drupal 7. An entity includes things like nodes, users, taxonomy terms, files. Um, but like I just did, people uh, always mix up the word entity with the word entity type. So an entity type is actually node, user, taxonomy term. And an entity is actually like a single node, a single user. And it gets confusing sometimes when people mean entity type and they say entity. So I think it's important uh, to not be afraid to, to create your own entity if you are building something that doesn't fit into the idea of any of the other entities. So instead of just making a content type for something that is nothing like a content type, you can actually make your own entity. Web forms, there's, there's a really great description on the web form project page of like when you should use a web form, when you should use a node, and when you should think about things as a web form versus a node. Um, sometimes the difference is, well, the problem with web form, I guess, is that there's not great views integration and the, you don't get all of the advantages you get with content types. So it's often a tricky situation when you're making some kind of application form, whether or not you want to use web form. And you kind of have to like think about it from all the different advantages and disadvantages on a case by case basis. Okay, so to wrap up, what are the benefits of semantic site building? As Drew Plippy says, I don't think there are any cons. The benefits are when you think about when you think about more of how things are named and think things through, um, your site will be more maintainable. It'll be more extensible. It'll be easier to hand off to another developer and in the future they won't stab their eyes out when they browse your site, which is just grokability. Like, can you just look at the site and it just makes sense how it's built. It's just built in a standard way. Um, and it's less likely to get messed up if it's clear how everything works. Um, it, like going back to pick on that taxonomy menu again, it's easy to mess that up because it's not clear how enough how it works, right? And you'll also have a better user experience if everything is kind of simple and clear. Um, another big reason to take a lot of time thinking through these things is what happens when you don't. So I, I have another talk called Lemon that's that kind of all about that because it's just so common these days. Because Drupal is so easy to get started doing site building, it's really easy to, to not be an experienced and knowledgeable site builder, but have built a bunch of Drupal sites. So then these sites end up coming to us and other developers as rescue projects. And doing these site cleanups where you have to change these architectures is much harder than building it in the first place. So you can't solve the problems on the level that they were created on, and then you end up having to write these huge scripts to combine content types and move displays, and you have to move items from, from because they had only one feature that ran the entire site. Now you have to, I had that recently, that they had a single feature and I had to turn it into 12 features. It took like 10 hours. Um, it would have only taken like a half an hour if they hadn't have had that one feature. Because the problem was, you couldn't just delete it and start over because some of the things in features don't it didn't exist in the database. They only existed in the features. So it's just a huge cleanup job if you don't do this right. And so I think that the way to achieve this in your organization, to like pay more attention to this kind of stuff, is through quality standards. I used to be a um, like a quality chemist so my entire job was just about standards. Um, the way you get quality is not, hey, we should have better quality. It's to have standards and processes for quality. So for example, one of the things that we do to make sure that everything that we do has, has the right level of quality is that we have a review system. So everything that gets built has is in a ticket, and it goes to someone else to review it. So if somebody builds a content type, 
it might go to me to review it and I'll say, hey, you forgot to fill in the description. And the name of it is capitalized, but none of the other ones are. You know, and you go back and change it because if you change it now before the client started adding content, it's easy now, but it's going to be a lot harder in the future. Definition of questions, if anybody has a question. So he asks if we do agile work. Yeah, I mean, kind of like most people will tell you it's like something between agile and waterfall. Um, they'll say like modified agile. Um, so it's sort of like we 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 are somewhat agile, but typically um, there has to be some information architecture done at the beginning of a project and then maybe like for each sprint we might have to do a little bit more um, but yeah we're trying not to just like randomly all be working on the site and building stuff all organically um, so yeah not super agile maybe yeah Yeah, so I am a co-maintainer on feedback module, and we decided, so feedback is like you, um, you, oh, there it goes, y you, um, you have a little, like, pop-up in the corner, and it says, like, is, is, do you have any comments on this page of the site? So we decided to make that fieldable, so that you could add, like, severity, Im um, screenshot, um, whatever else you needed to add. So to so so I made that into feedback into like instead of just being a form, it's an entity now. So you can go to like manage fields because and there had been an old old issue like from like Drupal five times that was like we should make feedback into a content type, and it was like luckily like we don't have to do that anymore because then you end up being like I'm gonna add some content today. What should I add? Oh maybe a feedback. Like it's just not really a content type. So whenever I have to make a new entity, I tend to just kind of copy what I did in feedback because feedback module is like simpler than um, than like node module. It doesn't do as much. Any other questions? Okay, thank you everybody. <laughs>